All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining another What Would Have Happened at NAB. My name's Tommy Flanagan. I'll be your moderator for today and tomorrow as well for this actually live event, which we're hosting in um, some sad circumstances, I know, um, but here we are. So let's try and make the most of it, and I hope you come away feeling like you've done a, a full week in Vegas in a good way. Um, so when we got the news about uh, NAB being cancelled for a second time, the video team here at Rethink were thinking about uh, what we could do to fill the void. And, and we realized that most of the panel ses sessions and virtual events and webinars typically bring together people from uh, very similar companies and they're discussing a single topic with partners and or customers with maybe five minutes right at the death for uh, a Q&A. And that's great, but it isn't at all reflective of, of trade shows. So we've tried to create something a little different in that it kind of captures a day in the life on the trade show floor, which is spent for many people flitting from one briefing to the next over four or five days. And often you kind of find yourself progressively arriving later and later to interviews because you totally misjudge the scale of the walk from one side, of the, the maze of halls to the other. And, and some people won't miss that at all. But the beauty of that is um, that each company you meet is often worlds away from the previous one. And that's kind of what we, we've got here. We've tried to bring a bit of diversity at, um, at very short notice. So with that said, we've got a great spread of industry pros who are going to give us some exclusive takes on uh, technologies and strategies that they would have been flaunting on the ground at the Las Vegas Convention Center this week. And I encourage you to grill them throughout the event using the Q&A Q function on the bar on your right hand side, because that's the best way to get value from, uh, from these things. So at our first stand, we'll start the day off with a strong coffee with a Detto and then hopefully hydrate and get a few nibbles at stand number two with Xilinx before we get on the beers at our third and final stop on the tour with Canoe Ventures. So please welcome Mark from Adetto, which, as you know, is a anti-piracy specialist. And Mark is going to introduce us to some of the strategies Adetto has in the locker from the OTT service provider angle. And I should mention that I'm seeing these for the very first time, just like you guys in the audience. So I might interrupt with some questions along the way, Mark, um, or I might just sit here scribbling some notes as I would do um, normally. So uh, please share your screen and take it away. Thanks, Tommy. Um, just quick Background uh, on my back uh, on myself. Uh, I've been with Adetto now for about 11 years. Uh, prior to working uh, for Adetto, I worked uh, for Foxtel in Australia, managing their fraud and operational security. And my first career was in law enforcement uh, as a detective and a prosecutor, mostly based in Australia. So I'm looking after cyber services at Adetto. I'm going to talk today about the convergence of piracy and uh, cyber threats. Uh, for OTT operators. Um, I think most of the audience is familiar with the, the nature and scale of piracy. Uh, but just some scary figures to throw at you. Um, global piracies cost the US economy between 29.9 billion and 71 billion each year. One in five Americans visit pirate websites and one in 10 have a pirate device. And that's from a very recent survey uh, this year. And Pirate subscription IPTV services generate subscription um, revenue uh, in terms of billions of dollars uh, per year. And Parks and Associate estimate that 10% of consumers switch, if 10% switch to pirate services, that pay TV operators could potentially lose up to 6 billion by 2023. Now they're scary numbers uh, indeed. Um, and to complicate things, um, Piracy has become much more sophisticated uh, and there's much many more uh, attack uh, vectors. So if you think about uh, 10 to 15 years ago, per se, we had to deal with things like uh, smart card hacking, uh, set-top box, um, control words, sharing, uh, camcording of a movie in a theatre and the selling of pirate DVDs. Now that uh, we've embarked on this digitalization uh, of the content distribution, um, cloud-based delivery and consumption provides immediate access to very high quality content. Uh, and digital video feed, feeds and files um, move um, right throughout the distribution system. Uh, so from creation right through to cons consumption uh, on whatever device uh, that particular cons consumer is watching it on. Uh, and the challenge here is that all of these access points 
are vulnerable to threats from content thieves. Um, also, in terms of OTT platforms, um, I'm sure most of the audience will be familiar with some of the more recent threats uh, around those platforms, including credential stuffing, credential theft and sharing, uh, CDN token sharing, session ID sharing, and more recently, DRM key distribution, um, which has, um, again, added, um, I guess, another level of sophistication. We do know from our investigations for our clients currently that uh, these attacks are being exploited by networks and we have pirate websites uh, that are, are using particular tools that allow them to extract and uh, distribute the, the content keys. Um, that's uh, creating um, not only a problem in terms of access to the content, but the, the, the consumer is actually utilising the OTT operator's bandwidth at the same time, so adding uh, salt into the wounds, I guess you could say. Um, but it's not, of course, just about piracy. Um, I think we're all aware that cyber attacks are very much on the rise. Uh, and in the US, there's been a number of high profile attacks in recent years. Uh, Equifax um, uh, just recently, um, the court upheld a, a $380 million data breach settlement with regards to Equifax. We know about, of course, the Colonial Pipeline and the um, the Bitcoin that was seized from the hackers in that particular case and the SolarWinds um, attack, supply chain attack as well. Um, and as a result of all of this, uh, we've seen um, recently a statement by uh, President Biden um, with regards to mobilizing and a number of new initiatives, which I'll talk about later. Uh, to address the cybersecurity threats. And of course, the media and entertainment industry is not immune to any of this. We need to deal now uh, not only with the piracy, but also with phishing, with ransomware, data exfiltration, disruption, uh, as well as piracy. Uh, on the studio side, we've seen breaches, uh, significant breaches uh, at Sony. Uh, we've seen uh, hackers uh, attempting to demand money from HBO to stop a leak of, uh, of Game of Thrones. And on the broadcaster side, probably um, or the OTT operator side, the, the most uh, disruptive incident uh, was around a French operator, TV Monde, uh, who were taken offline for a number of days by a cyber attack. We've seen um, we've seen an increase in the types of those types of cyber attacks. Uh, designed to disrupt um, the OTT operators and their platforms. And then on the larger platforms, um, more recently, um, and in fact, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, big breaches at Twitch and also um, uh, an offering of 3.8 billion users, uh, alleged offering of 3.8 billion users combined uh, details uh, with regards to Clubhouse and Facebook data. So it's not getting um, any easier <laughs> uh, for OTT operators. Um, there's a number of issues and, and challenges, of course. Uh, it's a very large attack surface. There's many different systems, particularly where there's been m and activities. Um, so quite often there's disparate video and corporate infrastructure involved. Um, there's a lot of administrative interfaces and risky ports that are exposed, unmanaged legacy systems that haven't been patched properly and are vulnerable. And of course, remote working during the pandemic has kind of exacerbated and extended the attack surface into the employee home networks as well. In terms of the governance challenges, uh, quite often with the media companies, um, it's it can be difficult uh, to identify whose particular responsibility is it. Is it IT? Uh, is it the, the, the people who are looking after the video infrastructure? Um, so the content security folks. Um, and quite often we, we see that there's a lack of coordination um, between those groups as well. Um, and there's a lack of cybersecurity maturity generally, I think, in many media platforms. Um, also lack of awareness. Most cyber attacks originate from human error. So we see quite sophisticated phishing attacks these days. Um, phishing via SMS, web, social, gaming, 
search and email. So just a recent example, even, even Odetto is a cybersecurity company, we're subject to uh, that type of attack uh, where one of our salespeople was approached uh, with a, a voice message on WhatsApp purporting to be our CEO. Um, the voice was actually um, quite close to our CEOs, um, so it was quite believable, but fortunately that um, that salesperson was awake to the threat and, and didn't proceed any further. But, um, yeah, we're seeing these types of uh, fake LinkedIn profiles and these types of uh, phishing and smishing is, is becoming quite prevalent in the corporate environment as well. And it's generally the smaller operators who are the most vulnerable um, as they don't really have the knowledge uh, and, and the resources to adequately kind of protect their networks. Great, thanks, Mark. I'm just going to um, jump in now and, and ask you, um, because uh, when when I'm exploring an operator's technology stack, it's quite common to find that there are multiple security suppliers used, but that's, that's kind of something, a, a trend we're seeing changing with all the cost cutting and the margin shrinking going on across the industry. And some in operators today just can't afford to have multiple multiple security suppliers. So I'm I'm wondering um, from the Adeta point of view, was business better back then for a company like yours, or does this give you an opportunity to kind of get a bigger share of the pie if you see what see where I'm coming from? Um, yeah, it's quite timely actually that one, Tommy. Um, <laughs> indeed, it does give us the opportunity to give a. a, a to, for us to get a bigger slice of the pie because cybersecurity, of course, uh, is an in hugely important, uh, has a hugely important role to play um, for OTT operators. So it's not, it's no longer uh, just about, you know, uh, robust DRM and, and um, con condition conditional access. Um, the best kind of solutions, um, you know, they, they combine technology enforcement and education. And so the, the First step, really, I think, is to understand what is your threat landscape. So, having uh, good threat intelligence gathered from you know open sources, from from the dark and deep web, and closed sources, so that you can kind of paint a full picture of your security and piracy threats. So you, you need to understand the nature and scale for you to be able to, I guess, develop and deploy your response plan. Uh, and then you know, content protection, as as I mentioned. Um, yeah, develop a, a cyber resilience uh, program as well. Um, make sure that your devices are up to date, your networks with the latest patches and, and they're kind of resilient uh, to the current threats. Um, and then in terms of the OTT threats, uh, there's a real need for AI driven analysis to uh, identify um, suspicious behavior on OTT platforms. So we've been working with a lot of operators uh, in that regard, um, but also um, detailed investigations to identify, um, you know, the threat actors and to take appropriate enforcement action, whether that's civil or, or criminal. So we help our clients build cases uh, against not only the, the hackers, but also those that are responsible for um, the commercial piracy and, and redistribute, unauthorized redistribution of, of the content. I mean, ultimately, it's about balancing security with reliability and, and, and um, scalability and efficiency. So it is a bigger pie um, and there's a lot more to consider, um, but I think it all starts with um, having a good intelligence to start with and, and then really targeting um, the most egregious problems. Mm -hmm. Great. And I remember in, in an earlier slide, you mentioned something about um, governments and and I know we we see a lot of new types of attacks and particularly ransomware but what we don't hear so much about is the successful criminal enforcement going back to your your previous um employer against uh, these these syndicates so what are governments and law enforcement doing to address the problem and how you do, how do you see it playing out in the coming years this is your opportunity to publicly criticize any government <laughs> you, you want by the way <laughs> well i guess there's a, a formal law enforcement um officer i'm kind of sympathetic um to to the problem um and you know the, i completely understand there is finite resources but when you think that um ransomware i think last year 2020 $350 million dollars in ransom was paid um to, to malicious cyber actors and that was a 311 percent increase um just to give you an idea of how quickly that's growing um and and look 
I think it's fair to say that governments and law enforcement agencies have been slow in coming to grips um, with the problem, but that's now starting um, to change. Um, so in, in the US, we're seeing good signs now. Uh, the government launched uh, a website called stopransomware.gov um, because that provides a centralised kind of hub for reporting attacks and information about the latest ransomware alerts uh, and threats um, from, from all the participating US agencies. Because quite often for corporations, the problem is I've, I've got this attack, you know, where do I report it? Where do I go to, to my local police? Or is, is, this, is someone better for dealing with this? Um, and as I mentioned um, earlier in my presentation, the Biden administration on 12th of May um, announced an executive um, order which is focused on cybersecurity and you know, the introducing initiatives uh, around information sharing, uh, having cybersecurity uh, standards in the federal government, uh, improving um, supply chain, uh, having a standard uh, playbook for, for a response um you know and an improved investigative and remediation um, capabilities um, over here in europe um there's been a similar sort of uh website set up called no more ransom um uh by the the national high uh national uh high tech crime unit in the netherlands um and interpol also has started to mobilize uh with regards to this and you you may have seen some recent press releases around some uh arrests that were recently made for um, a significant ransomware group so look the, the the enforcement efforts are starting to mobilize it's quite complex as you can imagine tommy you've, you've got uh threat actors in, in different jurisdictions and there's often a lot of coordination and that's where organizations like Interpol and Europol play a kind of critical role in, in pulling all of that together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so much of this um, industry is about awareness and it always ends up um, coming back down to that at the end of the day and, and you kind of forget about the, the technologies. But one technology I wanted to bring up before you go, kind of an elephant in the room that I couldn't leave, um, let you leave without asking you is with regards to Cinemedia's recent acquisition of content arm. And I wanted, wanted to ask you, how do you see that in, impacting the forensic watermarking market? Because a lot of companies are now sort of facing a future where their patent licensing agreements with content armor might not be renewed. And uh, and uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you see that playing out? Well, I have to be a bit careful about what I say here, and I, I don't <laughs> want to comment on what uh, Cinemedia's um, strategy uh, might be, but um, you know, I'm sure that will, will play out um, commercially. Uh, I do know that the watermarking, um, that watermarking in general is a critical tool, and it's certainly a, a very important part of Redetto's arsenal uh, in terms of dealing uh, with piracy. Um, having that ability to track content back to its source and switch it off uh, is invaluable. Um, it, it is it is a constant um, cat and mouse battle, though. Uh, ultimately, all anti piracy is, um, but it's cr crucial that you uh, have continued investment uh, in the watermarking technologies so that they can deal with things like uh, collusion and the, the types of uh, attacks that pirates are using to try and defeat watermarking. Um, so Odetto uh, is constantly innovating in that regard. And, you know, my team is constantly bringing back information into our product teams uh, and, and the engineers are refining and innovating and improving the technologies every single day. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's something we're keeping a, a close eye on. So we've got um, time for just one quick question from the audience before we'll have to move on to uh, our second company. So we've got one here saying, have there been any signs of DDoS attacks on live streams? And do you think blackmailing live events is an inevitable threat? Um, have I seen? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, at the moment, uh, look, it has been bandied about um, uh, DDoS on live streams. Uh, uh, based on our research, uh, DDoS attacks are generally illegal in most jurisdictions. Um, and uh, generally, those types of, of tools, if they are to be used, in my opinion, are best used by law enforcement themselves under uh, strict guidelines and um, strict controls. Um, but it's not uh, it's 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 not something I would advocate as a, a general 
path for dealing with piracy. I think it comes with uh, significant risk. Great. All right. Thanks, Mark. That was super interesting. And uh, now I know that you're a uh, ex law enforcement. Maybe I'll think differently next time I'm writing an article. Um, <laughs> and well, hopefully we'll see you again at the um, at the the end. We'll circle back for some more uh, audience Q and A. So yeah, please keep those coming in. So um, right, moving on to our second stop on the virtual tour, we have Xilinx, which is uh, a bit of a force to be reckoned with in the FPJ <laughs> field. And has done some pretty cool things in uh, recently with uh, Amazon, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we've actually got double trouble uh, from Xilinx. We've got, we've got Sean and we've got Aaron joining us. Hey. Sure that no stone is left unturned. So thanks for both joining us. But it kind of it reminds me of times at trade shows when I, I would turn up for a, a scheduled briefing and, and what would seem like the entire executive team would uh, <laughs> turn That's up sat right. around the table yeah, and exactly. feel like I'm, I'm the one <laughs> being interviewed, you know. So sometimes yeah. you've got to really stand your own as a one-man band. Um, exactly. But sometimes that's a welcome change from a, a one on one. But anyway, on with the show. Great. So please take the uh, the floor, guys, and we'll ping you some Great. questions as we go. So, so Tommy, thank you. Uh, just to confirm, can you can you hear me? All right. Yes, can hear you. Great. Okay, wonderful. And you can see the slide. Yes. Yeah. No. Nope. No, nope, you can't. Okay. All right. Oh, well, no, I'm just looking at a. Oh, you cannot. You're not kidding. Okay. <laughs> How about now? Yes. Okay, very good. Perfect. Okay, very good. Yeah, sorry for that delay. All right, so um, actually what Sean and I'd like to talk to you about is about 30 days ago, um, Xilinx and Amazon EC2 announced um, a new instance type within the AWS EC2 uh, uh, compute substrate. And specifically, these are the new Amazon EC2 VT1 instances. So this is intended to be a low cost, uh, per stream for a live video transcoding solution. And it's based on an accelerator, an add-in card that Xilinx developed called the Albio U30 Media Accelerator. This is specifically built for video transcoding workloads. And this, these particular instances that we partnered with Amazon to, uh, to, to put in place actually offer 30% better price per stream than uh, commonly used um, GPU-based instance and up to 60% better than doing this, this just in a software-based approach on a, on a beefy, um, Intel Xeon based instance. Um, the instances can be launched um, also leveraging Amazon's uh, Elastic Container Service and their Elastic Kubernetes Service for uh, containerized transcoding applications. And they will also be offering on prem deployments via their Outpost offering, which allows you to do transcoding at the edge. Um, and yes, indeed, we've worked very closely. This is very, um, you know, publicly known now for quite some time uh, with with Twitch. So Twitch is uh, a user of Xilinx technology to support its live streaming uh, platforms, and they chose the VT1 instances because they deliver the stream density and low latency that they need without compromising on video compression or video quality. Um, and that's a quote that we have here attributed to Marty Hess, who's the GM over at Twitch. Uh, the Amazon VT1 powered instances, uh, which are powered by the Xilinx Albio U30, the purpose built again for video transcoding workloads, and they're based off of Intel Xeon Cascade Link processors that have up to 190 gigs, 192 gigs of system memory, uh, and up to eight of these um, Albio U30 uh, media accelerators. I'll go into more detail in just a minute um, about what the uh, accelerators are capable of. And they offer up to 25 gigs of networking. Um, uh, throughput and up to a 19 gigs of dedicated elastic block storage bandwidth, um, which is certainly uh, critical, uh, especially uh, if you need to be moving uh, content from uh, like uh, an AWS S3 bucket um, for on, on demand uh, transcoding. Um, and Xilinx has also built a complete SDK, which is used to address these accelerators. Um, and I'll provide a link to that if you want to get started. Um, and this complements other AWS media services within its current offering, uh, supporting the ME uh, verticals. So here's a, a detailed view of the Albio U30. Uh, this is a high density uh, solution again, uh, and it's a half height, half length, single slot add-in card. Uh, it can support up to two channels of 4K P60, so that's simultaneous uh, throughput of two channels of 4K. 
which can be subdivided into lower um, resolutions. So it does offer uh, a very dense option um, if you've got a lot of um, streams to uh, simultaneously transcode. So we can support up to 48 channels at 540p30. And of course, that can be further subdivided into even lower resolutions, but you wouldn't be exploiting the, the full throughput. Uh, we do cap out at about 48 channels per card. Uh, we support both H.264 and HEVC. And in the next month, we'll be releasing support for HDR10 and 10 plus. Um, and this is a low power solution. So not only is this available to you uh, to deploy through AWS, um, but Xilinx also um, makes these cards available if you wanted to deploy them on prem. And in terms of the supported use cases um, that these accelerators were built to, uh, to support, it's live transcode. Uh, so that could support use cases like a live broadcast um, where you're compositing multiple um, uh, streams. Uh, I've got a, a timed um, item here on the slide. Sorry about this. Um, and then we also support adaptive bitrate um, transcoding. So uh, this is largely one of the items that uh, that a Twitch um, is, is using. So to support uh, multiple outputs in an adaptive bitrate use case. And then faster than real time is another um, option that we provide. So for example, um, we just did some tests where we were running the, uh, the Big Buck Bunny video, which is uh, the ubiquitous test content that we use in our labs. Uh, it's about an 11 minute video <clears throat> and you can apply all of the resources of the accelerator to actually transcode that file in as fast as 30 seconds. So, or 39 seconds, I think is what we actually ended up achieving. So this is the last slide. Um, we wanted to keep this tight and, and short, um, I think to about six minutes. Uh, and my slides are again, <laughs> sorry about that. PowerPoint's um, keeping you on time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. PowerPoint is keeping me on time. So let me do this. So, Can you so Aaron, see I, the maybe you could jump back to, to slide four quick. Sure. I, I just wanted to add in there. So, you know, we covered the use case as part of as part of the SDK that, that we provide. We've also implemented um, in a ABR scaler or what we refer to is an ABR scaler. So single in, multi out. So as a part of the solution, because we have programmable logic being an FPGA company, um, we have the ability to implement and have implemented um, some additional functionality. And, and so an ABR scaler is a part of that. We've also implemented um, a what we refer to as a look ahead engine, which helps and that is configurable. For, so depending upon sensitivity to latency and bit rates, you, there is configurability here. And all of that is included within the SDK, which I'm sure Aaron will will uh, communicate more on right now. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean, of course, we support a basic transcode pipeline, which would be decode, um, the adaptive bitrate scale, encode. To Sean's point, we further improve quality with this look ahead engine. So these are all kernels that are, are hardware accelerated either in programmable logic or in other ASIC regions within this uh, programmable SOC. And there's two of them in each of these cards. Um, yeah, so Sean, thank you for making that point. Um, just to conclude, um, if you want to get started today, um, you can. These instances cost about 65 cents an hour, um, and they can be uh, instantiated as we speak right now in uh, Amazon EC2. So I've got a link to their product detail page right here. Um, if you need any support or you want to get started with the docs, I encourage you to check out our, our full featured SDK. It also provides a lot of design examples. So we provide very specific examples on how one might want to go about doing adaptive bitrate transcoding. So one input, multiple outputs. Um, and um, if you have any issues, um, you know, we, we are constantly checking the um, uh, the repo, and you can file a direct support request through the uh, GitHub repository. I provided that link as well. Uh, if you're already an Amazon customer and you want to get your hands on these, um, we do encourage you to reach out to your account team. And if you want to learn more about the Alveo U30, um, perhaps you're not interested in uh, a cloud deployment, you want to deploy this on the edge in your own infrastructure, I don't hesitate to reach out to Xilinx. There's many ways that you can do that through the link that's provided here at the bottom of the list. Great, thanks guys. Uh, one thing I, I picked up on there, which I, I wasn't 
actually aware of, um, which is uh, HDR 10 and 10 plus coming next month. So if by uh, mid November, I don't have anything in my inbox and I'll be um, picking up the phone, banging down your door. You still, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't have to do it, Tommy. We'll pull it Looking back. forward to that. Um, so yeah, something I want to, want to ask, whenever we talk about the, the FPGA market, and I want to put my green hat on here mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. sort of talk about the reput their reputation as being real power guzzlers. So I want to ask you about how Xilinx is actively going about reducing that, especially with next gen codecs like AV1 in mind, which has a similar reputation. Right. Yeah, so indeed, um, if you were to implement, and, and Xilinx has, right, we acquired um, the smarts of a, a company called NG Codec, a world-class uh, encoding team uh, that have actually developed um, some of the algorithms that we've implemented in the program of Logic here. Um, but yes, indeed, if you were to implement um, uh, one of these encoders in an FPJ, indeed, it would be um, not very dense and it would be quite power consuming. So Xilinx is certainly taking a different approach here <clears throat> and we're leveraging this SOC product that actually has um, a hardened uh, encoders uh, in the ASIC region of these SOCs. Uh, so that saves power tremendously. I mean, if you think about it, you have the ability to run 48, 540p, 30 channels on a single card that consumes no more than 25 watts. That's, that's a very low power solution. And Xilinx indeed is focused on the next generation product um, that will be out in about a year's time, uh, which indeed will focus on the AV1 or will add support for the AV1 encoder as well. Um, and that too will be a very low power solution as well. So strategically Xilinx knows that for video to be successful, uh, we really need to stay focused on lowering, continuing to lower cost, um, the area in which these accelerators consume, um, and then also the power. So uh, these are all areas where we're very focused. Awesome, saving the world one step at a time. Um, so going back to what's on the uh, screen, are there any customers you can tell us about in that regard? Is it too early to talk about customers? Well, as we'd mentioned, um, Twitch is um, um, a consumer um, of this um, solution. Um, and we have other customers that are in technical trials right now. Um, we also have other customers I can't mention um, that are deploying this on-prem in their own infrastructure as well. Not the not the VT1 instances, but the accelerator card that these instances are, are based off of. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Um, and uh, an, another elephant in the room. I'm, I'm going to ask everyone a, an elephant in the room, I think. But um, I wanted to just touch on the the takeover uh, by uh, AMD, uh, the ongoing takeover. And I'm, I know this is all about bringing kind of more into competition with Intel, particularly um, with 5G. But I wanted to, to ask you guys what we can expect from Xilinx's core technology uh, going forward under a new parent regime. Will it be less video and more RAN as we as we as we move on, for example? Well, I think one of the reasons we were um, acquired or are being acquired is because we actually offer uh, complementary solutions, right? Xilinx is an adaptable compute company. AMD is a high performance compute company. And so those are actually um, very complementary features. So um, suffice to say that we're very focused on our, um, our longstanding roadmap in video and continue to establish leadership in this space. Yeah, I, I think I would, I would also add that if you look at um, if you look at the markets that that AMD is is strong in, um, you know, with GPUs and certainly, um, you know, they they've won. They have a very strong uh, um, ASIC group as as you know, winning with um, with both uh, with Sony and and uh, Microsoft from an Xbox and PlayStation standpoint, and I believe Nintendo. Um, and, and think about cloud gaming, low latency streaming. I, I think what each company brings is is very interesting um, IP, and, and you could I think make the mental leap to to see how when you add those two companies together, how you could make something very powerful. Indeed, yeah. Yes, definitely going to be uh, powerful. So synergy is largely, I mean, it's largely a plan will be exploited here, I think, with the, with the bring together. Uh, so we're super excited um, to, to become a part of that team uh, when that when that uh, transaction closes. It's not yet closed yet. So we're still an independent uh, entity at this point. Yeah, 
Got it. Okay, we got a uh, question from the audience here. Uh, have you seen any impact on the market from Google's new uh, VCU, video coding unit, Silicon? And has Google always been closed off and therefore hasn't shifted the needle? Yeah, so the, the team is is well aware um, of Google's VCU. And I guess the, the point of distinction I would make here is that this solution and this offering is very much focused on real time or live. Um, I would say that the, uh, the VCU solution, <clears throat> while it is capable of supporting live use cases, is a very dense solution focused on file based um, uh, deployments. Um, it's not to say that we aren't a fit in file-based, we certainly are, um, but it would be in, in terms of, again, leveraging the full throughput of this product uh, to do things like just-in-time transcoding where immediacy is key. We've got to get a new video asset up on a platform faster than anyone else. So um, certainly we see it as um, an interesting um, a solution in the market. Um, but again, Xilinx supports uh, not only um, uh, AWS publicly, uh, but we, we work with many of the, the hyperscale uh, companies. So again, Sean and I are both part of the, the data center group at Xilinx. We both come from the broadcast business there uh, originally, uh, and the data center group is largely focused on servicing the uh, the top hyperscale companies in the world. Yeah. Uh, so you're I, suggesting that there's no money in file-based anymore? Uh, I wouldn't say that, no. Um, and and Xilinx will stay focused <laughs> on, on supporting that in the future. But um, given um, our, our heritage in high-performance, uh, high-throughput computing, live video uh, was uh, an obvious area for us to focus on initially. I, I, would, I would also say that um, it, if you look at the number of applications that are moving to the cloud, whether it's, you know, uh, production, post-production, you know, packaging, all of that, um, and the number of different applications, it, it becomes critical that you have, I think, a, a flexible solution. Uh, if you read about the Google VCU, it is a very uh, defined, targeted solution for a very specific set of use cases. And, and so um, it wouldn't really be appropriate for a more general purpose and, and trying to support a number of, of applications. And, and so we believe that there's, there's room in the world for both types of solutions. So I, I don't think we really see it almost in some respects as competing. Right. Okay, perfect. That's a good uh, place to end. Thank you very much, guys. I enjoyed that. And um, we'll uh, move now, last but not least, um, to the Canoe Ventures stand, which uh, means we, we've got some blisters on our feet by now and we're, we're craving uh, <laughs> a nice crisp lager. So it's probably time to lose the jacket in a minute. And uh, hopefully, Chris, you're going you're gonna to help us end on a high here with some uh, addressable ad talk, which I think is quite a fitting place to... Um, to end, actually, as an industry which has experienced some real highs and lows during the, the pandemic. So I'll hand it over to you for our showstopper now. Yeah, uh, great, Tommy. I mean, there there is that old adage, uh, you never want to be the last guy between, uh, you know, you and drinks. But, um, but you know, it's all virtual. So <laughs> we can uh, we could just pretend. Uh, Going to do a screen share here. Uh, and I believe, like the others, we had to do a full screen. So let's see if I can make sure I've got that working the way we want. Uh, hopefully, you got that uh, full, Tommy? Yeah, we can see that, Chris. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, hats off to you and all the work you all do at Rethink. Um, I've been a new customer of yours in the past couple of years and uh, just wonderful, insightful work. So thank you for all that, that you do. Thank you. Yeah. Very kind. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. I'm Chris Pizarro, SVP of Global Sales and Marketing at Canoe. And uh, yep, here in our virtual NAB. Um, I, I think the, the big news for Canoe is the one thing we were really excited about to show up in physically at uh, NAB was for the Technological Emmy Awards. Uh, which are now uh, happening virtually, uh, but uh, we're very proud that uh, Canoe, we actually did win uh, a technical Emmy for our work around uh, what I'm now going to, uh, to tell you about. And that is 
uh, specifically for uh, video on demand. Uh, and then uh, in a few more minutes, I'll get into uh, some work we're doing in the linear uh, addressable uh, space, which will be of, of interest. So at Canoe, we enable cross-platform simplification. And as Tommy said, we're very much in the ad revenue uh, game and how to optimize ad revenue uh, across uh, multiple uh, TV platforms. So what we won that Emmy for is that Canoe enables MVPD VOD. So if you're a TV network and you're inserting ads into your shows on an MVPD's VOD uh, device and platforms, uh, you're going through the Canoe ecosystem. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of good technology that's in our ecosystem, but you're going through the Canoe ecosystem. So for instance, if you're uh, a consumer in the US and you have Comcast uh, X1, and you click on your VOD menu and you say, I wanna watch AMC's Walking Dead. Uh, when the program starts to play out and ads are being uh, inserted throughout that program, that is going through the uh, Canoe ecosystem. Now, these days with AVOD being such a, a hot topic and a hot trend, uh, it may not seem a big deal, but 10 years ago when we started doing this on old Qualm cable systems, uh, it was kind of a big deal. And again, that's what we've won that Emmy for. Um, so fast forward to today, not only are we inserting ads uh, across Qualm set-top boxes, but also now more and more within the MVPD plants on IPTV set-top boxes, on tablets, desktops, uh, mobile. So all sorts of devices, all sorts of platforms uh, when it's playing out. So the scale of what we're doing is across 38 million households, across Comcast, Spectrum, Cox, and Frontier, there's a uh, feature set that's common across all. Again, many different technologies uh, that are throughout here, but we make all those to a common denominator so that when an advertiser talks to an agency and, and tells them we wanna insert our ads uh, on VOD, they talk to a national TV network, their system in turn talks to Canoe, and we in turn send all that information, all those ads, all that metadata down to Comcast, Spectrum, Cox, and, and Frontier for a, a common set of uh, features and functionalities. The programmers taking advantage of this, so the TV networks, uh, everyone from A to Z, so from AfroStream and A&E and AMC, all the way down to you know, V&W from all your Viacom networks and your Walt Disney companies. So we have uh, 110, TV networks that are utilizing those 38 million homes uh, to get VOD um, uh, out there. So again, our traditional business and um, still going very robust, uh, even with more AVOD platforms uh, uh, coming on to play and OTT and <clears throat> streaming and, and such. Uh, what we've done, what's really new for NAB this year, uh, what we're, we're really planning on telling a bunch of folks about is adding addressability for the TV network's uh, ad capabilities across uh, linear and across VOD. So what that now looks like when the agency uh, says, uh, the advertiser says to their agency, we wanna watch you know, AMC's Walking Dead. Now you're not just targeting on Walking Dead, but you can say, I wanna watch Walking Dead and I wanna reach people who make 150K plus a year or I want to reach people watching Walking Dead who uh, have a, a three or more kids in their home. So now you can refine your target uh, even more the way, frankly, you could do in digital for years, but we brought that capability to uh, the TV networks playing out across Comcast, Spectrum, Cox, Frontier on set-top box linear and on set-top box VOD and on the IP linear and VOD systems. Um, where we've been on that currently, we're uh, deployed with AMC networks, with Discovery, uh, with Viacom CBS. So uh, these numbers just hot off from Q3 that we've provided uh, the service for 21 different TV networks within those three programmers. And uh, we've done it across 120 addressable uh, campaign lines. So. Uh, this year was really a banner year for this capability. Uh, again, we're doing this across VOD and across traditional linear 
on the TV network's national inventory. So the cable companies, the MSOs have been able to do this on local inventory for some years, but the real story now is that we are doing this for AMC, Discovery, Viacom, CBS on their national uh, inventory. And we're in the process of enabling uh, three other programmers uh, really soon, hopefully announce those in Q4, if not early Q1. So I think Tommy, you and others have probably been reporting on well, uh, addressability in the States is, is gonna be coming for probably you know 10 years now. Um, and uh, hopefully it's one of those uh, quick overnight successes that only took 10 years to bring to market. <laughs> Um, and just one other quick note, knowing that your audience uh, is very global. Yes, uh, everything that I told you about is focused on the US because uh, that's that's really what's new. Uh, but Canoe uh, does work in Canada, in Latin America, uh, and in Europe on these and other uh, capabilities. But again, only have six minutes. So I uh, just wanted to, to take you off on the, the stuff that's really hot and new for NAB. Uh, and that's it, Tommy. Perfect. That was bang on time as well, Chris. Uh, as my alarm goes off, there it is. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. <laughs> as, as if I almost rehearsed it. Yeah. Did, <laughs> did you practice that one, maybe? Um, so, uh, first of all, Chris, I mean, I was initially going to um, sort of ask you some generic questions about pandemic trends, but, um, but then yeah. I, I came across um, something about... Uh, uh, that we'd written about a few weeks ago about certain companies uh, pushing for advertisers to start committing something like a 40% share of TV ad budgets to OTT when today's average is something like 14%. Mm -hmm. So I was then curious to ask you whether Canoe Ventures would be ready to execute that kind of massive shifting of, of the scales if you see that happening at all, even when it happens. Yeah, um, so, uh, so the quick answer is yes. Uh, in that, because of the the processes that we've really put into place over the last ten years, um, and 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 we're big fans of that because, listen, NAB is all about new technologies coming in, right? So the puck's always moving. Uh, so we know what is common, no matter what the technology is, right? There's certain things you need to have in place and have either automated or processes in place. Uh, that check for uh, quality and for it be able to scale, um, and and that we do have. So um, and we've already seen we we've seen the shift happen, right? We've seen it already go from zero to five percent to ten percent to fifteen percent to twenty percent. Um, so uh, yes, as the ad marketplace has more uh, trust in uh, these alternative platforms to just linear. Oh uh, yeah, I, we're absolutely ready for that shift, and um, it, it really is a matter of uh, you know, a, a lot of the things. There's variations on them, but it's still the same concepts. You have to make sure the metadata is there. You have to make sure the ad breaks are there. You have to make sure the ad assets are at the edge when they should be. So a lot of those concepts are the same, no matter what the pipe is. Um, you just maybe have to adjust them a little bit. Yeah, got it. And um, I should note that by some companies, I actually mean Samsung Ads, who uh, who said that. Um, so, do you, do you fancy giving a sort of ballpark time frame for when you might see that forty percent um, number being hit? Um, sure. Um, it, first of all, the ad market has always traditionally lagged behind consumer behavior by a year or two. Just. It has always been that way, but seriously, whether it was radio shifting to black and white TVs or cable switching to broadcast or uh, TV shifting some money to what was broadband video 10 years ago, right? In the ad market, it, it takes a little bit of time to get that trust there, to get the measurement in place. Um, so things don't always move as fast as some would predict, uh, but I'm absolutely bullish on that we can get to a 40 or 50 percent of uh, a shift going to well alternative platforms than vod um certainly in the 23 24 marketplace like that i don't think that's going to happen in the next year year and a half um but certainly in the the uh, you know what is a couple of upfronts away uh absolutely can get to those to those levels 
Great. All right, you're officially on the record now, Chris. That's okay. I don't. I don't mind. I like it. I like a good challenge, Tommy. No worries. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay. As promised, there, there was going to be a, an elephant in the room, and I couldn't let you leave, Chris, without asking you on Ooh. your opinion on um, the infamous uh, Nilsson. So, where do you stand on this now out of favour measurement giant, and what are the uh, the the alternatives do you think um, from Canoe's point of view? Yeah, Canoe's point of view. Um, We've always, so so as you can tell, we, we have a, a massive amount of data that we collect from the programmers, from the from the MSOs, from the MVPDs, and always have been entrusted with that. Um, so we're, we're more about the raw data. So we've never been in the measurement game per se. We've always said, hey, here's the, you know, the raw data. We've scrubbed it, you know, to make sure it's accurate. We've done all that stuff, sort of stuff to accumulate it into one place. Uh, and we will we will hand that off basically to whatever measurement company uh, either our MSOs or our programmers tell us we need to. So you know if that has traditionally been, hey, we need you to feed that those data points, that reporting, those impressions into Nielsen. Uh, you know we've done that. Uh, that it has to go to uh, Comscore. We've done that. And yes, most recently we've had our programmers say, "Hey, can you talk to the guys at at, um, at VideoAmp, or the guys at iSpot, or the guys at Samba? Um, they're trying to figure out, you know, cross-platform reach and frequency for us." And um, our answer is always, you know, if legally we can do it, uh, and they're a, and they're a safe place to a safe haven to put the data, and our programmers want us to. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll cooperate with any of those folks, and we and we are. Uh, so we're we're a bit Switzerland in that respect. Of uh, we figure our job is just to make sure that the the raw data gets to where it needs to in a in a safe manner. All right, we'll leave it to um, us at Faultline to be anything but Switzerland. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Thanks, Chris. That was that was um, great. I enjoyed that. Um, so we've probably got enough time now for one audience question each. So we'll go back to the um, beginning. Mark, if you're still with us, I am indeed, Tommy. Got a, another uh, another um, audience question for you here. Are there any solid metrics for how much of the losses attributed to piracy are actually lost sales, and not just views from consumers that have absolutely no intention of buying that pirated content? I don't know if you have those numbers to hand. Um, yeah, again, it depends on the type of piracy uh, as to the, the, the numbers are involved in it. Um, quite often, we don't have the visibility into how many end users are connected to a particular pirate service until, for example, we do law enforcement. Uh, raids uh, or support law enforcement with their raids and um, we uncover quite often um, pirate networks operating uh, in the hundreds of thousands and in some cases millions of unauthorized viewers um, so you know I think if you go back to uh, surveys indicating um, one in five uh, people in the US are, are using uh, pirate IPTV, TV um, we see that kind of figure replicated over here in Europe. Um, so, uh, and and uh, IPTV, the use of uh, streaming devices, uh, apps and add-ons, um, they're the most concerning because they're aggregating thousands of premium uh, channels, live sports. Uh, they generally also have um, a substantial video on demand movie uh, library. Uh, and you're getting that in one plug and play device which you know just needs uh, three to five megabits and will provide a HD or near HD experience and you're only paying between 100 and 150 dollars per year for for that pirate subscription so um, it's very hard as a law as, as, as a legitimate uh, operator to compete uh, with, with that type of um, that type of offer of course um, so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a complex problem. Um, it requires, as I said before, a combination of, uh, you know, technology and ultimately uh, education pays, plays a huge part here as well. So particularly instilling um, at the very earliest ages in, in school children, um, a respect for the value of, of intellectual property and the creativity that goes into the whole industry um, is, is an important factor in dealing with the problem. 
Great. All right. Thanks, Mark. Do you get to see the uh, the body cam footage from uh, from these raids? Actually, quite often, we, we depending on the law enforcement agency, uh, if they need support on the ground, we will go with them. Um, wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, on previous occasions, uh, I may have forgotten that I was no longer <laughs> in my law enforcement capacity. And I actually, uh, a couple of times I've, I've ended up interviewing people at the scene um, because it was quite, uh, I guess I was a bit more experienced than some of the junior police officers on the ground. But we're always there to provide support and guidance and help law enforcement um, because, you know, the technical capabilities, the, the forensic uh, capabilities are, are, are not always there um so we're, we're there to provide that support to them when they oh, need it a takeaway that i didn't expect to get but um there we go all right thanks <laughs> okay the uh the guys are, uh xilinx one for you is it inevitable that the biggest video platforms pursue their own silicon strategies or is there always going to be enough room for mass market players to address it's a, it's a great question, um, and, and one that we certainly contemplate. Um, indeed, um, these, these companies have massive teams <clears throat> that are certainly capable of producing their own silicon. What we find, though, is Xilinx is forming a uh, much closer partnership or relationship with these, these companies. And indeed, uh, we have um, acquired, uh, again, through this NG Codec team, and we'll continue to add uh, algorithm talent, um, which is uh, differentiable in, in markets. So we find that we are collaborating more and more. Uh, but yes, that is ob obviously uh, continues to be uh, a challenge uh, in, our, in our space. Sean, I don't know if you had any comments to add to that. You're on mute, but Yeah, I, I would just say that much like I had said before, that there's um, some of these customers where they have a very specific use case. You know, Google was mentioned earlier, so if we continue with that with YouTube. But if you're AWS, for example, and you have a thousand different customers, um, then you need you know, one solution can't can't really service all. And, and so we believe that there will continue to be opportunity um, for, for uh, partners like us to, to collaborate with them. And in some cases, they may still continue to drive their own silicon, but use us as well. Great, all right, thanks guys. Um, Chris, we've got someone in the, the audience who's looking for an update on the Go Addressable initiative. The, uh, the website apparently says it's coming soon, but um, the launch happened in uh, June, apparently. Uh, yes, yeah, Go Addressable. Um, we obviously fully support that initiative. Um, as you saw in my presentation that we've got Cox, Comcast, uh, uh, Charter, Frontier under our umbrella currently. Uh, but that's still only one third of the addressable footprint in the US, right? It's it's wonderful and it's a great start. It's certainly easy. Uh, but then you say, okay, well, you know, what about Dish? What about Direct? How do the satellite guys play in? And, and how do some other tier two, tier three players come in? Uh, and that's what the Go Addressable Initiative is about. It's how do we uh, grow the addressable footprint to essentially as many US households as we can. Um, and I do believe if they check back on the website, I do believe that there is now uh, an event that was just announced yesterday that may be November 3rd, uh, but certainly check back on, on the Go Addressable uh, website and uh, there'll be more information on that. But, but yeah, we're fully supportive. And what we're doing, Tommy, is um, any things that we have figured out already uh, across our footprint, is we will absolutely work with the guys at Direct and LTN and Dish and you know, uh, everyone else to really put best practices in there so we can truly have a fully addressable uh, footprint in the US. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, guys. And then I guess that concludes day one of what ha would have happened at uh, NAB 2021. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure. We might cross paths at one of the many exclusive after parties that i've been invited to um but no uh, seriously i know that there are loads of other online events happening uh this week so big thanks to everyone who who tuned in today um um we had a lot to uh, compete with so uh and thanks to to anyone uh, who's watching in the future on demand and uh, hopefully see some of you at day two tomorrow all right so thanks everyone thank you very thank much you. thank you cheers all. appreciate it Bye. cheers Bye.